Ghana for this really important event. And I'm delighted to say that um, we are working here in Ghana in partnership with the Ministry of Education here, looking at some curriculum reform work and also at looking at the inspections work. Let me first just um, introduce uh, who we are. So I work for Education Development Trust, and we are an international not-for-profit organization that works with governments around the world to improve school systems and also to provide careers advice and guidance. And our mission is to provide evidence-based solutions that transform lives through education. We work in partnerships with government and we design and we deliver large-scale reform programs. We also undertake research, and research really underpins what we do as an organization, and we like to look for what we call bright spots, areas where things are working well, and trying to understand what are the lessons that we can learn, what are the lessons that policymakers around the, uh, the world can learn from where good things are happening in education. These are just a couple of examples of um, some of our uh, recent research, innovation and achievement, the work of four not-for-profit school groups, a really interesting analysis of uh, how uh, uh, four not-for-profit school groups have made a difference in improving education outcomes. And also, particularly relevant for this conference, technology-supported professional development for teachers. What are the lessons from developing countries? In the UK, we also run a centre dedicated to excellence in the use of education technology. And this is a centre that provides advice and guidance to schools and teachers and policy makers on making the most effective use of education technology in the classrooms. And I just want to give you a flavour of the work of our Connected Learning Centre. Digital technologies are so important in school today because they're so important in the workplace. Um, there are very few jobs you can do these days that don't involve using technology in, in some way or another. So we need to make sure that children are prepared for this, using computers in a way that kind of enhances everything they do and gets them ready for the workplace. In the years I've been teaching, technology has just changed so much. and It's what um, the children are just so excited by and used to that it's just got to become part of the way that we teach. Technology is all around them, they're all very, very um, used to using iPads, phones, computers and things like that. And if we don't give them skills on how to use technology in a variety of ways, then they are going to get left behind. Digital technologies are important for schools for lots of different reasons. Not least of which, it's because it's a medium with which our children are very familiar and which our children use throughout their daily lives and actually will end up using a lot more than us. So having an understanding of how digital technology works is, is important for them. It also is exciting and fun for them to use. I use interactive whiteboards, iMacs, netbooks, iPads, computers, loads of Technology is a way to engage students. It's a way to get them really motivated and excited. And also technology, of course, can help students do things that in the past they wouldn't have been able to do before, whether that's filmmaking or programming themselves, building websites. So we need them to be able to access all of those different new ways of using technology. Thank you. So that was just a very brief introduction to our Connected Learning Centre and really illustrating the point from the perspective, particularly of teachers and the children, how really important it is uh, to prepare children for the 21st century world of work, that we have to make sure that technology is part of curricula, is part of the learning that children are getting. But, as I said, I want to ask these four questions. Where is the promising practice? What are the reasons why technology reform often fails? 
what should we be teaching students about technology, and also how do we make sure we get buy-in? So what bright spots are there in the world of education technology? And I think the key message here is that technology can be involved in any and every aspect of delivering education. And you have to think of the system as a whole and see where technology can support the system as a whole. But you also, really importantly, have to understand what is the problem? What is the problem that you are trying to address? And then what is the technology solution that may be able to uh, deliver the change on that particular problem. And I want to give you a couple of examples of where technology has been the tool to help solve a problem. So this is a program that Education Development Trust worked on a few years ago in India. The problem was that teachers weren't turning up at schools. The community were cross about that and wanted to make sure they had a way of influencing the teachers turning up at schools. And so we designed a model with the local community to give the parents mobile phones and they went and checked on whether the teacher was in the classroom for their children and they texted the messages back to the, the local educational authority. The impact of that very simple use of technology to empower the parents and to empower the community had a hugely positive impact on the teachers actually turning up. So a very simple example of the simple, straightforward use of basic technology to address a particular problem around uh, teachers turning up for work. A second area where we've worked, and this is a program that we're running in Rwanda uh, in partnership with the government of Rwanda, the Building Learning Foundations program. The problem there is teachers are working hard in the classroom. How do you improve their learning? How do you improve their pedagogical skills without taking them out of the system? And again, we developed audio and video content as part of a teacher's toolkit used for self-study by teachers for their own professional development. And getting together communities of practice of the teachers using videos so that teachers can see examples of good practice, learn from that, and actually learn on the job with their peers with positive examples of things that were going well. This is a group of teachers watching a lesson together as part of the video for, for reflecting on their learning practice and learning what really works. And again, the technology is, is a, it's a tool, it's a facilitator to enable the teachers to improve their pedagogical skills. That was the problem, this is the solution. There's also very good evidence that if you can personalize education content, based on an individual student's learning, then their learning levels can improve significantly. And again, that's the particular issue of different children in different classroom settings will be at different levels. And there is the possibility of personalizing content through technology to engage students more effectively. So three or four examples of identifying a particular problem and then using the right technological solution in order to help solve that particular problem. But technology reforms also often fail. This is a, a relatively old example of, of uh, former Prime Minister of the UK, Tony Blair, who invested millions of pounds on getting computers into schools. However, the learning outcomes did not improve. What was the problem they were trying to solve, and was that the right solution? Millions of dollars have been spent on the one laptop per child program, and that is also what now widely seen as a wasted investment. And massive open online courses, a huge buzz about MOOCs around the world and their potential to deliver education and training for individuals. And they were seen as transformative, and, and, and particularly for teachers, but for other groups as well. However, the dropout rate of early courses was very, very high. 
and the ability to sustain engagement and interest through MOOCs proved to be very challenging. So the Blair government invested in hardware, but they didn't train the teachers or the school leaders. And indeed, they thought there was a, uh, there was a solution putting computers into schools, but they actually hadn't identified what the problem was that they were trying to address, and they hadn't invested in getting the teachers on board and the school leaders on board in the most effective use. The Global One Laptop Per Child program assumed that students were capable of self-directed learning, but that's not the case. And again, it seemed like a quick win, a technological solution, but what was the problem they were trying to address and had they worked through whether this was the best answer? And likewise, MOOCs for teachers initially depended entirely on online learning. And most adults, and indeed most children, if not all, also need to have some face-to-face -face interaction. You cannot replace the teacher with technology. You have to engage and involve the teacher with technology as well. This is um, uh, just a, a couple of, of pieces of evidence from other researchers in this, this area. Will technology transform education for the better? Clear researched evidence that initiatives that ex simply expand access to computers and internet alone generally do not improve the student outcomes in K-12. to And a more direct quote, throwing equipment such as tablets or laptops at schools without addressing the training of teachers has not resulted in any sustainable solutions on the African continent. So there's a strong message here. Simply throwing kit at a problem is not the answer, and you will waste funding in doing so. It's really important, as I said, that teachers are actively and positively engaged with developing the solutions, making sure that they absolutely support the role that technology can play in their classrooms. Excellent technology resources should be in return for higher levels of professionalism and better teachers. There is a deal to be done with teachers. We will support you. We will develop you professionally. We will invest in you and in the technology to support your learning in the classroom. But in return, you have to invest. You have to engage. You have to support its use and make sure it is used as effectively as possible. Policymakers really have to deal with teachers and they have to deal with school leaders. And there's a, a, if we invest in technology and we have professional high level expectations of you and we ex then expect you to teach more effectively with the resources at your av availability. And that's the bargain that we need to strike with the teaching profession. We'll invest in you, we'll invest in technology, and together we can make sure that we make a difference in the outcome of student learning. But is it enough to teach students just how to use equipment? And I think the clear answer, again, as we're preparing the next generation for the workforce and the jobs and roles in the 21st century, is that we also need a curriculum that focuses on understanding computer science. It's not just about how you use technology, but you actually, children these days have to learn about effective uh, use of, of coding and of using IT in every walk of life. So from a young age, students should learn about coding, computational logics and robotics, and they will learn valuable problem-solving skills and valuable thinking through skills through the application, through the use of, of learning about coding and technology. Kids these days need to understand what algorithms are how they're implemented as programs on digital devices, and programs that execute by following precise and unambiguous instructions. They need to be able to create and debug simple programs. They need to be able to use logical reasoning to predict the behavior of simple programs, and they need to use technology purposefully to create, organize, store, 
manipulate and retrieve digital content. And if you develop a curriculum that gives children the skills in these areas, then you are empowering them for the future, and you're also building on a range of the additional skills that, that children need in order to um, uh, su succeed in the world of work in the 21st century. The UK has just introduced, or relatively recently introduced, a new curriculum that really does involve coding and using computers effectively in the classroom. And um, the, the, uh, the video showed a couple of examples of where that is, is being used effectively through the support of our Connected Learning Center. And in this continent, coding and robotics are now being piloted in the curriculum of South Africa as well. So there are opportunities to learn from where there is good practice, not having to repeat uh, the errors and, and challenges of um, uh, introducing a new concept and again uh, as an organization education development trust looking for where there is good practice learning the lessons of that and making that available to uh, policy makers around the world so I just want to finish this section before I call upon my colleague from the ministry in Ghana to just summarize the four key points of the message that I'm trying to get across here. The first one is, this is about the whole system. Technology is not something that you do in, a, in single boxes. You have to look at the whole system, and technology has the opportunity to change and transform in a positive way every aspect of the system of education. However, you have to identify what the problem is so that you're very clear that you're using technology to address a particular issue, a particular problem, and you understand where technology can be all or part of the solution to that particular problem. You have to engage teachers. If you don't engage teachers, if you don't invest in their own professional development and their own understanding and use of the technology, and if you don't make sure that head teachers and system leaders are on board and understand, then it will fail. And there are multiple of examples of where simply investing in kit, putting them in the schools, and expecting something to change has failed. So it is really important that you also invest in making sure teachers and school leaders understand and, and want to use and are empowered to use any technological solutions. And then finally, it's not just about using technology. For the modern child, for the modern education system, you have to also build a curriculum particularly around aspects of coding and effective use of, of um, modern compu computational techniques, because without those skills, those children are not going to be equipped for the 21st century world of work. So those are my four key messages. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite um, the Honourable Dr. Yaosei Adutwam, the Deputy Minister of Education here in Ghana, if he can join me on the stage. Thanks. Just the two of us, yeah. Please, yeah. So I, I know, Dr. Antoine, that you've been thinking a lot Dr. about... Dr. Educhum, because we are in Ghana, I have to correct you. <laughs> <laughs> Educhum. Educhum. Yes. Forgive me. So I know that the ministry has been thinking a lot about its work, particularly in the broader range of, of science technology um, in, in education. Following on from what I was saying about the importance of, of coding, but as part of the, the wider input around STEM education, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you're thinking and planning and have succeeded in achieving here in Ghana? Thank you so much. I, I, I think before I get to what we are doing, I, I, I will want to talk about what has propelled the government to seriously look at STEM. Our president, um, I call him the education president, 
uh, somebody who believes wholeheartedly that we cannot transform our fortunes without transforming our education system. So he's uh, basically looking at how does education become fit for the purpose of national transformation within the context of Ghana Beyond Aid. A nation that depends on new resources can only do so if it transforms its education system. And if you look at the recent study by the Brook Institution, by Rebecca Winthrop, talking about the fact that it will take countries like ours a century, one century, over 100 years, before we can catch up with the developed nations, if we don't change anything. A hundred years, a lot of years, yeah. and it doesn't appear as if those countries will be waiting for us. So if you want to take a hundred years, by the time you get there, they are gone. And therefore, you need another hundred years to catch up. So in that sense, you never catch up. And technology offers a great opportunity for transformation of our education system. First of all, I look at technology always within two contexts as a learning tool, as well as a tool that we need to learn about. And uh, when you talk about computers, and it is introduction, for example, um, if you compare it to, let's say, owning and driving a car, you don't have to really know how the engine works. Apart from taking it to the workshop and understanding that every two months or so, the car needs to be serviced. That's all you need to know, and that your car will run very well. Uh, when we come to technology, we are not only, especially computers, we are not only talking about using it as instructional tool for teachers or learning tool for students, but also talking about how do you learn about the hardware and the software components of the technology, how do you do coding, and all the things that get the computer moving. Many years ago when I was teaching uh, computer uh, classes in, in America, and I saw the change in the attitudes of my students, even in an urban school environment. Students, after we did HTML, when they entered the code and they saw that the, the, uh, the face of the computer has changed from red to blue, would jump up and down, and they would come to me and say, tomorrow, what are we going to learn? When I was a math teacher, I was not getting that from the students. Yeah. But there was some sense of excitement that came from the students who were learning about the computers and who were not just using it. There was a sense of accomplishment when students were able to build a computer for the first time. They jump up and down. They begin to learn about the various parts. And it gave them a certain sense of efficacy. It told them something that you are capable of doing something great. You are capable of doing something possible. So as we embark on the adventure of ensuring that computer, and, and the good news is that now we have a curriculum that includes uh, computing, and, and, uh, which is being implemented by the Ghana Education Service. And this is self-empowering, to say the least. I went to UK, I think we, we went together to a school, uh, talk about Scratch uh, 2 and the students. The teacher was leading and it was excellent. Interestingly, I came back to Ghana, the next day, uh, we went to Bishop Girls, not too far from here, and they were learning the same thing that students in the UK were learning. But interesting thing is that in, at Bishop Girls, it was being taught by a student. And the students were paying attention, and she was telling them what to do. He came to the conclusion it was a sight and taught by a student which tells me that we have a greater opportunity in terms of this transformation that we've embarked upon. We have children who are so focused, who are attentive. I, I always tell the joke that I, in America when I was teaching, it was hard to get the kids to sit down for me to teach them. In urban America, it's not easy. And everybody walks into a school in Ghana and the kids will stand up for you. If we cannot educate these children and get them to compete with the rest of the world, it's not their fault, but it's our fault. And that is why I like what this president has allowed the minister to do at the Ministry of Education, where we've embarked on BSTEM program. Our BSTEM program is not just looking at the curriculum, but one interesting aspect about technology and STEM, for that matter, is also the fact that you need to integrate with other subjects. Yeah, because you're doing programming, you're doing computer science. If you are not good in mathematics, there's a point where you get caught up in your inability to move forward. Logic and reason is not great enough, you don't do very well. So it's critical that as we talk about technology use in the classroom and learning about technology to begin to learn how do we integrate it in other subject areas. So if you look at the digital literacy curriculum developed in the state of California, for example, it's integrated into mathematics. 
And then the mathematics curriculum also integrates into engineering. And then you have other subjects, um, also science. New generation science standards in California, for example, integrate into engineering. So if you look at the curriculum that we're developing in Ghana, we've looked at how do you integrate in other subject areas? Because if you don't, assessment becomes very difficult. Teacher training becomes very difficult. If you want a teacher of computer science, well, look at what standards in mathematics should be covered before they can teach COBRA or they can teach uh, HTML, which is at the basic level. They may not be able to do that, but if you integrate it in the curriculum and it comes with the books that they have to use, then it becomes easier to form professional learning communities when teachers can come together and begin to use the resources to improve the teaching of technology and also, of course, STEM. Uh, because the jobs that are emerging are going to be in that field. When you talk about artificial intelligence, AI, and how it is changing the world, and the fact that uh, the research is showing that three people are anticipating that 40% of all manual jobs are going to be eliminated. If it's going to be eliminated, it's going to be replaced by robots and other AI devices, power devices. And if that is what is going to happen, where is Africa going to be? Because you see, the work that is being done by the young men and women on the street is going to be taken over. And then we have to buy robots and other equipment at a very high price. So in a way, you've lost the jobs. Yeah. You have to come up with money to also buy the equipment from other places in the world. I recently visited uh, California, and I went to my house, and it was so clean. And I was surprised that my son would clean the house so nicely. But I was sitting there when I ran about 11 p.m., I heard some, a voice saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. I said, who is coming? And then I turned around, and this um, robot, you know, that cleans the house. And so that, the job of a cleaner is now gone. And can you imagine that happening when we don't have all these workers? And we are not um, building those equipment. We, are, we don't even know how to program them. Where is Africa going to be competitively? So I think uh, this is not um, one of those things where we let opportunity pass by. All of us should begin to look at what is Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, if we don't understand it. And if we don't do what it takes to compete in the fourth industrial revolution, by the time the fifth is, we are gone. So, so it's a sense of urgency that has brought the president of this sense of urgency, has brought the president of this country to look at how do I open access to education for all so that when I am improving the curriculum, I am making an investment for everyone. So when you talk about free senior high school, Ghana has a gross enrollment, secondary enrollment ratio now of 62%. We're able to increase that about 12% in two years. Now, the gross secondary enrollment ratio, the average for Africa is 33%. We are 62. When the data for next year comes, I'm sure we hit 66. And then we'll be moving up to a point where every school-going child, when we're able to get them in school and get the secondary education and enrollment ratio going up, then we are seeing we are showing seeds of transformation. But it's not enough to do access. You have to also look at the quality of the curriculum and what is going into the schools. So for example, when you talk about teaching PowerPoint, right? That's an opportunity to integrate history. Because the students can do a presentation of the history of Ghana. So, so when you are, you are not just teaching them in silos and stand alone, the PowerPoint or the Plexi gives you an opportunity to talk about the history of the country to talk about the student videotaping taping themselves in drama, for example. And that becomes the presentation that they are doing in their technology class. So those kind of opportunities are tremendous. I, I know I have to be careful with time because yeah. I'm a teacher and a politician. <laughs> And we talk for a living. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. no, thank you very much. I mean, very clearly, there's a, a far-sighted view here, and you're developing this, the STEM curriculum and trying to integrate it effectively across the schools. But, but what are the challenges of that? What, what are the problems that your ministry is facing around that, and what are you doing to address them? I, I think there was one technology that was ruled out called the iBox. And iBox worked in a beautiful way, Ghana made, Ghana um, designed, and which enabled you to have local Wi-Fi mated in such a way that if you have your computer, you can get access uh, to content, quality content that was in the box. 
No, but if you don't get the clients, if you don't get the computers, and, and the Ghana Education Service at the time was not allowing students to use phones, so what it means was that the content was boxed up in the iBox and it couldn't come out. So schools that did well, the ones who were innovative and allowed the students to use phones, iPhones after removing the same and other things, and now they're doing very well in that area. But I think the critical thing was the fact that we were underestimating professional development. Underestimating in the sense that in Ghana, there was no people free day. Yeah. There was no day set aside for teachers to be by themselves to study and learn and be able to come to school the next day with an understanding of what went wrong the previous month, what did not go well. Now, the minister having realized that as a major deficiency have now um, authorized and now we have days set aside within the school curriculum for professional development. It's a major accomplishment yeah. within the Ghanaian context. Uh, something in America we take it for granted, but here it's a big deal. Now teachers have this set aside uh, at the basic school level, going to move on to high school level. And once, once you do those things, then you can create professional learning communities. You can't talk about professional learning communities when you haven't given time for the community to be built. So we've looked at some of the impediments, some of the things that really stand in our way, and we are removing them one by one so that we can truly we can truly transform the education system and get our kids to compete with the rest of the world because I think they have the mindset, the culture, and the demeanor that makes it possible for our children to compete with anybody anywhere in the world. Fantastic. And indeed, that is actually perfect timing. I saw the <laughs> <laughs> We're being counted. But, but I think that also absolutely uh, links in uh, to one of the key points that, that I was making as well, that if you want the technology to work, if you want the children to learn, you have to also make sure that the teachers have the time to learn and understand with it and, and be partners with you in its effective implementation across the system. So thank you very much for that. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah.